This Zero Now program is brought to you with the support of our founding partners. I can't be protected by hopes and prayers. I won't use hope towards what's next. I'll make my own way. I know impossible is an opinion. I won't wait for safer schools. I want to create them. I don't want to be afraid anymore. I refuse to be a victim. I'm just one person. Determined. To bring us back to zero. I'm just one person. Determined. To bring us back to zero. I am just one person. Determined to bring us back to zero. And uh, Chief, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, why don't you give us a little background in the history of, of this FURTIS program with uh, just to get things started. We're really interested in learning what you've done and, and the whole origin of the program. Well, absolutely. And first of all, thank you for having all of us on. This is an important initiative that we uh, started at Inyer State College in Fort Pierce, Florida. And FURTIS is an acronym, uh, F-E-R-T-E-S. It stands for Future Educators Response to Emergency Situations. And the whole premise for this program was to prepare our future educators now while still in college for what we've termed that post Marjorie Stoneman Douglas world that they will enter upon graduation. And it's interesting how this initiative started. It actually began as a conversation between myself and a local elementary school principal. Immediately following the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting, uh, everyone was out scrambling, doing active assailant response drills, learning about uh, run, hide, fight, or whatever model system you use, what are, what is a, a you know, single point entry, you know, what's, uh, you know, cover and concealment, what's the difference between it or this or that. And, you know, so we're dealing with some very caring people who are in the education field for a reason. And 20, 30 year tenured teachers uh, are looking at us like, you know what, we didn't sign on for this. You know, a lot of deer in the headlights look, you know, and, and so there was some emotion too, because, you know, a lot of our educators just, they don't want this to happen anywhere, but let alone where they work and especially in an elementary school setting. Uh, so I looked at the principal and I said, you know, we're just going to have to go through this every year. And this was pre Marjorie Stoneman Douglas law passing where we have requirements now in the state of Florida for, for many things. And, and I, I looked at him and I said, it makes you wonder what we're doing in our colleges and universities to get our teachers ready now. And in digging further, we looked at the first recorded school shooting in American history was in 1764. And so it kind of begged the question, isn't it about time that we started focusing on some of these things while our future educators are still in college? So we took that idea to any state college and, and spoke to uh, the uh, then dean over the College of Education and Dr. Uh, Zagantz was there as well. And we pitched the idea about developing a program at any state college where we're preparing our future educators. And uh, so Dr. Gazan can, can to talk about how we embed that into the program, but it is centered around a specific course. Uh, they get content sprinkled throughout the 40 hour class and the training culminates at some point because they can take this course either their third or fourth year in college, but the training culminates for them with a full day with law enforcement officers going through active assailant response drills, talking about pathways to violence, um, situational awareness. Uh, we do stop the bleed training, um, and we get them exposed to uh, specific people in our school districts that Frank can talk about uh, better than I can. And uh, But the bottom line is this. We are preparing future educators now while still in college, and we, we have some important recommendations about this program that we will be willing to share as this webinar progresses. And, and uh, uh, Frank, I mean, how tactical is the program? How deep do you get when it comes to prevention, response? I mean, how... So for us, having them come over with knowledge of, of this already, it, it's just a game changer for us because they're coming in, a lot of them now have been doing drills as a student, they're going into the college, and now they're going to see the other side of it. They're going to be in the lead of these drills. And so for us, it gives us a starting point that we don't have to start from scratch. They already have the knowledge that they need coming in, and now they just have to learn our system. So when we get them, all we have to do is, is train them on what we're actually using in the district. So like the chief said, it's basically um, everything's based on run, hide, fight, a little different in every district, but it, it's based on that. And, and they're more receptive and they actually know the why. They know why we're getting into this. We look at what happened at Uvalde. When I do my training, I put up pictures of who was lost in Uvalde, who was lost at Stoneman Douglas, and I let them know the why. 
and they get it. They got the training at the college. They're getting the training from us and they're so way ahead of everyone else. So it, it's a wonderful program. Chief, you have thoughts on that? Well, I couldn't agree more. And as Frank was talking, I was reminded of the analogy that we use. We are molding and shaping the clay. And when the students leave, they get to their employer, whatever school district or that they go to, and it's up to that district to sand and paint that clay. And again, in the state of Florida, we have very strict guidelines that all schools must follow as it pertains to the drills and so forth. And, and while we don't want these things to be you know, old news for teachers and so forth, we don't want them to get complacent, if you will, we are now uh, generating a, a, you know, uh, we're creating, I'm sorry, a generation of educators who are kind of being pre-wired while still in college. So then when they go uh, to their employer, they have some expectations of what safety and security will look like. Um, because the, really what we hit them hard with is, is teachers can't teach and students can't learn unless they feel safe and secure. And it is your responsibility as an educator, as well as other employees who work in your school to ensure that safety and security. It's your job to make sure the door is locked. It's your job to pay attention as you're walking from your car to your single point entry and cognizant of your surroundings and reporting things that you see. And as we are drilling them at this point while still in college, we expect them to go to their employer now with these understandings of their responsibility uh, moving forward. So um, would you mind just explaining what the different roles are uh, with the three of you? What, you know, who, who's, part of the, who's part of the team? What, what are the different components? Um, how, does, how does this get rolled out initially? Who wants, to, who wants to take that one, Chief? Start with that. Okay. So in order to develop the program, we had to get a, a number of people at the table. Law enforcement, since this was a law enforcement initiated project, the college, which is where uh, Kim represents, uh, Frank, who represents one of four county school districts that our college primarily serves. And then we looped in our state office of safe schools, which was created in the wake of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting. And the office of state schools is part of our uh, Florida Department of Education. And their specific role is to ensure that schools uh, comply with the, the laws that have passed in, in, the, in the wake of the shooting and any new laws that passed. Because a very important commission was formed called the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Commission. And they make recommendations every year about um, you know, what we should do in the legislature to make sure that our schools are safe. So the, the four of us were, were part of the original think tank to put this course together to develop the curriculum. And now we all play an important role in ensuring that the students are learning what they're learning. For example, Frank gets students, his district, all our school districts get students during internships. And the purpose, the point of that internship is to reinforce the information that they're learning in the classroom. And then when we get them as law enforcement officers for that full day, we reinforce those things that they've learned in the classroom and while they were out during their internship. So it's a true team effort that resulted in the development of this, this curriculum, and we couldn't have done it without each other. Right. Now, what we'll do is we'll, like you said, we'll go in depth on what I do in my district as far as active assailant response. So the ones that are coming to my district have a little bit of more knowledge. I mean, we're not gonna go into the full training, but we are a lot of time to go into each one of what we're doing. And then there's a lot of questions. So we're in the district, we're doing this every day. So they'll have questions for us and we'll have a Q and A with them. And that's after that the chief and law enforcement did their training. And this is pretty much towards the end of the day. The last time I think we were on in the afternoon and they have a lot of questions and we're there to answer from a district perspective perspective. So they know what they get into when they're doing the training. Um, they're going to be spending hours in classrooms. So this way they have a head start and they know a little bit of what they're, they're going to be doing when they get to the district. So Kim, what does the curriculum look like? What is the structure? What's the, the form? What can, what can a, um, a, a, a potential teacher expect from the program? Sure. So we kind of keep the uh, goal in mind of preparing uh, tomorrow's teachers today. And so what we noticed in the conversations that we had with Chief initially um, were that, yes, the teachers get the training when they're out in schools. And yes, our students may become with some of the drills that they've done in high school, but there's a gap where our students are then going out into the schools to teach their practice lessons. They're out there observing. They're out there in front of the classroom. They might be that first line of um, 
you know, point of entry when someone enters the classroom. And so how are we preparing them? And that was his initial question. And we were like, well, we have classroom management. They do their class layout. They design where they put their furniture. And, you know, and then he says, well, what about hard corners? What about, you know, where, you know, purposeful position of bookcases and things like this. And, you know, these were terminology conversations that we hadn't had, um, knowledge that we didn't have as teacher um, prep, you know, faculty. And then, so we weren't preparing our teachers for that, um, that role, I guess. And so it, part of these collaborative conversations then turned into this work group and involving the Office of Safe Schools at Florida DOE was really important because all this new legislation was coming down. And so we wanted to make sure that we had everything in place from all areas. Um, and so what we did was we developed four modules. Um, the students first go out into schools during their early field experience where they go out and they do observations as part of classroom management. And so when they do that, now they're having these critical conversations about the drills, not just participating if they're there, but asking, so, you know, what is the what do the different colors mean? Or what am I supposed to do as the teacher? And um, what, what do you take with you when you go on a drill? And where do I get this information? And, and who is my school safety, you know, officer or deputy and, and, and go, going and meeting with them and asking them questions. So we've given them guided notes and questions that they can then pose to these important people in the school. And they're in different schools throughout their program. So now they have these questions that they can ask at all the different schools. They can find their single point of entry at every school. They can understand why they don't need to prop the door open. They don't have keys when they come. Remember, they're not an employee. So, you know, they need to be cognizant of not asking the teacher to leave the door open for them. Things like that, where that's an inconvenience, but now they understand why that inconvenience is so important. So they start in early field, then in their practicum, they go out and they do the practice teaching. Um, and through that, they have modules that are embedded into their curriculum. Um, and so some of that um, includes uh, see something, say something, of course, um, understanding the pathways to violence. So now they're, um, they're um, aware of what to look for in their students so that they can identify um, problems before they happen. They're becoming proactive rather than reactive. Um, and then all the different uh, types of support that, and resources that are available to them that maybe we weren't having those conversations before. It wasn't something that we taught directly, where now they can meet all these people and then come to this um, full day training. They can meet their school districts, um, directors of safety, safe, you know, their safety and security, and they um, can have these conversations before they're put into these situations. Um, and then the other thing is situational awareness. So not only are we teaching them in the classroom when they're the teacher, when they're doing their practice lessons, but then the situational awareness also takes them outside of that situation to the mall, to the movie theater. You know, they have a lot of conversations about situational awareness in general when they're getting out of the car in the parking lot and walking into the school, what are the things they need to be thinking about? Um, so that happens at three different points in the program. And then during student teaching is their very last semester. They're all out in the schools all day. They're doing their internship. And that's when we do the full day um, PD session with them. Um, and then I know she touched on uh, adding stop the bleed and that came about because, you know, they're, they're very honest and um, with the with the students and they'll say, you know, we may need to step over your students to go after the bad guy. And so our students are, you know, our, our student teachers are like, well, what do we do with our kids if they're injured? They didn't feel like empowered to do anything. They didn't know what to do. They didn't have the tools. And so we added stop the bleed training in there so that our teachers would at least understand tourniquets and understand like how to how to provide that very first, um, you know, uh, first aid for the students so that they they feel um, that they're able to do so and they feel empowered and it kind of creates uh, what Chief and I like to talk about this paradigm shift, you know, where now they feel like they um, they are prepared to handle this. They put them through that physical training so that it's not the first time, so. And it's all about building a culture of safety, right? It all starts with with culture, right? M more so than uh, you could have technology and, and other things to respond, but the, the goal is to how do we prevent an event from happening in the first place? If you create that that environment, and one of, you know, we often say in, in you know, with Zero Now and in these conversations that, you know, the, 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 re the real first responders are the people in the school at that time, because it's going to take some time, minutes, you know, eight, 10 minutes for for the professional first responders to attend. But having that knowledge on how to respond and, and how to stop the bleed if there's a situation or mitigate this, the, the scope is absolutely, absolutely critical. And, and, and Kim, just for the folks that are joining us, so 
Is, is this is this a multi-semester program? Is it a one semester program? Is it are there workshops? How how would you exactly define what that what the FURTIS program is? Sure. So it's multi-semester. Um, it started as the full one day, all day PD, but we realized that we needed to kind of front load the information or back load it, I guess, um, so that we went to the beginning of their program. And um, we've created PowerPoint modules um, and some of the law enforcement officers have done videos for our students um, where they explain situational awareness or they explain pathways to violence. Um, and it's the same um, law enforcement officers that they see later in the full day training. So we're kind of making those connections also that are the, the guys in their school district. And so they watch these videos, they have guided notes that they complete while they're watching it. So they have to pause, they have to reflect, they have to ask their cooperating teachers and the people in the schools, the questions, they come back, they write it down, they turn it into us as the uh, professors, the faculty members, we have the conversations with them. There's discussion between the students, the faculty member um, and their peers. Uh, and then um, that happens at, at three different times throughout their program. So the first time would probably be uh, the beginning of their junior year. And then the second one would be the end of their junior year, beginning of their senior year. And then the culminating event happens at the, the end of their program, the senior year, when they can put it all together. No, no, that's great. Thanks. I appreciate it. And, and so, Chief, I mean, where has this program or what are the, the results of this program? Have, 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 have you had an opportunity to see that in, in the real world? Um, the deployment Because the, the program started right before COVID, correct? And then it was not really able to be rolled out until immediately after. So where is it being implemented right now? Right. That's a great question. And uh, first of all, I want to apologize for any background noise. This is South Florida and we've been inundated with thunderstorms for days and, and we've got one passing over right now. But um, so I would like to focus on internally and externally. Internally, what we're seeing, uh, I think, uh, you know, that Frank had already alluded to is that, you know, in Florida, we started the mandatory drills in our schools immediately following the MST shooting in 2018. And so we're getting a generation of students that have already been through a couple of years uh, of active shooter drills. Um, ultimately, we'll have students who have gone through an entire, you know, 12 years school years of active shooter drills and now they want to be teachers um, but some of our students have been through active shooter situations in reality uh, one group of interns we ran through this course actually experienced an active shooter when she was in school and the experience of training immediately brought all that emotion out and the memories out and so forth and so um it, it became very real and apparent to us that this, the reality of this program moving forward has to account for student experiences prior to them coming to our class. Uh, and she worked her way through it, came back out, finished the training trooper that she was, you know, so internally we've learned a lot from our students that have helped us, um, you know, um, massage the content and the delivery of that content. Externally, however, we've got a lot of attention throughout the state uh, I think I mentioned uh, earlier about the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Commission. We did brief that commission, and uh, that, that meeting was recorded and televised, and it's available for people to watch back in September of 21. And we made some important recommendations, which we can go over here today. Um, but uh, as a result of that involvement with that commission, we developed relationships with a few of the parents who lost children uh, at the MSD shooting. And they have become very strong advocates for this program and believe very strongly in what we are doing as a means to, uh, to, to prevent. And one so much, uh, Max Schachter, uh, he created a nonprofit called Safe Schools for Alex. He lost his 14-year-old uh, son, Alex, in that shooting. Max has testified before uh, the Senate in, in Capitol Hill. And during that presentation, he mentioned our program uh, at Fort, in Fort Pierce and what we are doing. And so we got a little national attention as a result. And then we've also uh, gotten an audience with our for, uh, uh, Florida Director of Education, which, which is a very important, uh, significant thing for our program now. So a lot of attention. Lot well, of you time. know, it's interesting and in something that uh, the Kim mentioned is, is you know, the, the paradigm shift, right? And, and, and the, the younger generation coming in, uh, you know, to the, to the program and, 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 to, and to school, you know, it seems like you know, you have this never hear mentality that nothing will happen here. Why, why would we be proactive with things versus being reactive, which is part of the human condition? But 
you know, I, I think say the older folks are like, yeah, nothing will happen here. We're not going to invest. We're not going to invest in proactive safety measures. But the the younger generation, it's it's not a matter of uh, if it's going to happen. It's a matter of when. And so it's not the whole never here uh, perspective is definitely has definitely changed. And I know I've got two, uh, my son and daughter, both in college, and it's 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 it's, it's an expectation, and, and that, which is sad that we're at that point, but it is. So you know the, the the paradigm shift that Kim mentioned, I think, is also apparent with the perspective that this is a real that we we prepare, we prepare for fire drills, uh, fire safety. We used to prepare uh, for a nuclear attack. You know, I know my school had a, a, a nuclear shelter in, in the school, hide under the desk, but it is, it's the, the threats are ever changing. Uh, what are your thoughts, Brink? So we're keeping it current also. So experience in 9-11. During the attacks in 9-11, right afterwards, everybody was engaged, everybody was involved. And then as time went on, People got on with their lives and it was forgotten for, for the most part. So we're five years now away from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and we don't want people to forget. We want to keep it current. We want to keep going with this. So it doesn't come passe. It doesn't because you want to keep everybody in with safety and keep going on the way we're going on. And what, what better way to do it in doing it at a college level when they're actually learning about going forward so they have it in their mind they're coming in and they can give a a, a new perspective on on when they come to the uh, to the district absolutely chief thoughts on that hopefully you're not yeah, stuck can, in a thunderstorm yeah, no, sorry i can only echo what he what he has said and and uh but we're to add to that that you know we are truly building life skills here kim mentioned it uh, one of our instructors talks about uh, some active shooting uh, training that he had done outside of this program and how uh, a student uh, of that class got back with him a few weeks later and said, you know what, after your class, we were up in Jacksonville vacationing and they were at Jacksonville Landing when there was a shooting that occurred there. The Jackson, and it's, you can look it up, the Jacksonville Landing shooting. And it was a marketplace type event out in public. And uh, his response was, I, I just went through your class and, and I, I knew exactly what to do. And so with our young educators who, you know, they are mostly in their 20s, mostly young women, uh, these are life skills and, and we are shifting that paradigm. So this, this is just training that they're going to get when they come into college now. It'll be a matter of this is my program. They won't know any different. And right. uh, it's the teachers who have been out there in the workforce that you know whose paradigm we're now continuing to shift as a result Frank, and just think about it if we have this the way it goes and it just keeps expanding for a perspective from someone like me that's in a district that everybody that you're going to be getting um <clears throat> as new employees is going through this program now and on a whole that's who we're going to be having how much easier would my job be you know how much easier would it be to now train them just in the specifics of the school and get to other things as far as, you know, threat assessments and, and stuff like that, because they already have the foundation of what they need to do in an active assailant situation. And now we could um, <clears throat> pretty much just go into the being the proactive side of it because they know the reactive side. You know, uh, Frank, uh, um... You mentioned something earlier about, you know, after 9-11 and, you know, how, you know, you forget, you move on and, you know, but, you know, you accept things as the new, the new normal, right? And, 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 and kids are become desensitized. We're not kids. We, we all become desensitized to, to you know, the, the, the stories of violence on a regular basis. And, and, you know, we just cannot accept that as the new normal, right? We can't accept that and constantly being proactive. Uh, Kim, I think you had some thoughts as well on that. I was just going to say that you see throughout the day our students come in and and they have some background knowledge of having the program you know the uh, content throughout the program but it's not until they start hearing from the law enforcement officers about um like their role as the as the teacher but then also you see you know in the beginning they um were they have them just hide and they turn off the lights and they walk by with the um the gun and it's just like you feel like um 
stuck and you don't feel like you have choice and you don't feel like you have um, any way to fight back because you're just hiding. And so then the next time they do it, they teach us, they teach the students how to how to fight and how to like um, fortify the classroom and all those things. And when the students do that, you start to see the leaders rise to the top and you see the students who are hesitant and I'm sure uh, Chief and Frank, you can talk a little bit more about this, but you see the students who are hesitant and kind of hang back and let others kind of take the lead. And then as they practice a couple of more times, you start to see the ones who are hesitant. Now they're like, no, I wanna give it a try because now they see like it's a safe space to do that. And it's it's um, a place to try it before you might actually, you know, ever have to use these skills. You know, the goal, of course, is to never use it. But if you did, at least you've tried it once in a safe space. They can give you corrective feedback right there. You can stop and ask a question. This last semester, we had a student in the in a wheelchair, and so his questions were, "What what do I do? What what can I do to you know help in this situation and so to keep my students safe?" And so it helps you just think of everything in a different perspective. Um, and I was meeting last week with um, at our public safety Insti training institute and the, uh, Lisa was sitting across from me, said to me, she said, oh, I just want to let you know my 10 year old is in one of your graduates classrooms. And uh, during our meeting, she pulled out her go bag and she'd been through the furnace training. And she said, and you don't know how safe that made me feel knowing my son was in her class. She went through the furnace training. She's got her go bag. She's there with confidence. She knows how to keep my son safe, you know, as best as she can. Um, and some of the feedback I was just going to share from the students uh, that they've said the first training was very helpful, made me feel prepared for a variety of situations that could, could occur, not only at school, but in outside situations. Um, and then having this training makes me feel empowered to handle such a situation by being able to physically practice understanding the mindset of an assailant and items to include in a classroom kit. Um, best training I've ever received. I've taught for two years, and this was the most helpful one. It was an emotional day. And so we've trained over 100 students now. Um, and so it's we're creating this network uh, out there in the school district. And it just, um, you know, so I don't know if they have anything else to say about that. With the leaders rising and like that, you were talking about that paradigm shift. It's it's big. We see it happening right in front of us. So. Well, you mentioned the big C word, which is critical confidence, not critical confidence, right? Knowing what to do with confidence. And that is, you know, part of a holistic, we always talk about a holistic approach, you know, um, we talk about preventing an event, you know, through cultural aspects, see something, see something. And, and um, Dr. Geller uh, makes an excellent point about, you know, not only seeing something, saying something uh, for negative behaviors, but also positive behaviors that helps foster a, a culture of, of, of trust and empathy. Uh, but knowing what to do with confidence is absolutely critical. And, and imparting that on, on uh, future educators is absolutely critical. Frank, I think you had a comment. Chief. Well, yeah, so uh, I, I wanted to speak to that because uh, one of the participants was curious to know about uh, what you do uh, to recommend staff that, you know, that go into a mental freeze, if you will, uh, because we are teaching critical skills. And, and so that's a great question because one of the uh, active assailant response models talks about the 10-80-10 rule or 10-80-10 composition where 10% of folks generally are able to act in emergencies, give directions, take leadership roles. 80% are able to take direction and, and do as they're instructed to do. And then you have another 10% that really they freeze. They, they, they don't know what to do, how to do. They, they're, they're more of a, sadly, I think you can look at them as being more of a liability at that point. Uh, and, and we don't ever want to think of our people as that. So the, the answer is to, uh, you know, when you have these conversations and you do these drills, you try to encourage people to self-identify. You know, where do you find yourself on the 10-80-10 spectrum? And, and then let's, let's talk about that. I mean, we all know a leader when we see it, right? And we all know good followers. And, and then we may have a sense about someone who might not be able to rise to the challenge. And so we're all in this together. And so the thing to do is to really identify who's where uh, and then make plans to account for that in addition to uh, all of the other things, sadly, that you have to account for in an active shooter situation. Um, but I just thought I would address that question and it, it, it tied right into what you were just saying. Frank. And then I was just gonna add, so for us on the school district side, 
it, it's so great again to have them give that foundation for all this. So they're getting the foundation. And now when we do our training, and it's all going to depend. So it's going to be a little different if you're teaching in a high school than you would be if you have kindergarten or first or second grade. So there's going to be variations of what we're going to be doing as far as if an event happens, but they have that foundation and it's critical that they have it. So now when we're dialing down even further, it's much easier. So again, it's just, it's an amazing program. So other other programs like this in, in uh, around the country is I mean is there a plan to expand this on a, on a national basis? Who wants to take uh, Tim? And you want to take that one? Sure. So um, not yet that we're aware of, right? So um, we have had some interest at the state level um, after Chief's meeting with the um, Commissioner of Education, and so we do have a plan to. Um, meet with all the colleges and universities, all the teacher ed programs this Friday in the state of Florida and have a sharing session similar to this and share what we're doing here at Indian River State College um, with in collaboration with the school district and law enforcement. And then um, we're planning a train the trainer. So we'll bring um, colleges and universities or any teacher prep programs that wanna come to our college. Um, and we're encouraging them to come and uh, you know, with three people. So at least a teacher prep person, a law enforcement person and a, a, their school, school district lead. Um, and when they come, then they can, the teacher prep people can go through the active shooter training. The school district um, folks can have those conversations that, you know, together law enforcement, they can see, uh, observe it um, and be able to then before they leave, have a plan in place for how they will then implement back home um, in their community. And so that's in the works now to start um, in the fall. And is, is this part of, is there a certificate that's associated with this or is it just part of the, just, but just part, part, of, part of their degree? We do have a FERTA certificate that they receive at the end of the training. Um, they also receive a Stop the Bleed uh, certificate, so. Um, we have a few questions from participants online. Um, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> Uh, Michael asks, are you incorporating behavioral threat assessment action teams into the training for future educators? Uh, so we have what we call threat assessment teams by statute, and they uh, are comprised of school personnel. Frank can speak to that a little bit more specifically from a school district standpoint. But we do loop in that concept in the training so they understand it, and they have the opportunity to interact with the school safety specialists to talk more about it and while they're on their internship uh, at their schools. So with what Furtis teaches um, the signs, right? Because when you get to a school district, especially if you're new, you're probably not going to be on a threat assessment team. So each school has a threat assessment team and it consists of an administrator, another school official like counselor, um, some other staff member and law enforcement. And when a threat comes in, they're going to convene and it's basically not only to make sure that to see if the threat is active or not active, but also once that's established and law enforcement did their piece, now we're going to do the uh, pieces we need for the students. So we're going to get them the accommodations they need, what's going on in that student's life and going forward, how are we going to help that, that student? So it wouldn't really be um, something that a new teacher coming in would, other than seeing the signs like the doctor said or the chief said that we give them information about that but i don't think that at that point they'll be actually on a threat assessment team but it's good they get the background they know to look for signs and then possibly in a few years later when you know they move up or they get into administration they could also move into that role smoothly if i could just add on to that as part of our um program earlier on we do send them to florida doe uh and help them locate their district um, information and things that have already been approved for their district. And so then they're able to read what their district specifically is doing. So that's helpful too. Chief, I'm gonna direct this one to you since you're the uh, 
the founder of the program or inspired it. So uh, Hank asks, you know, uh, he's from California and asking, saying it's very difficult to get traction there. You know, thoughts on that? I mean, it, it, do you, is this is this part of the, the symptomatic of it's never going to happen here type mentality? I mean, how, what 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 advice would you give Hank regarding California uh, getting support? So um, I know the states, the, the two states are very different politically. And, and I don't know if that's providing any issues or concerns among folks in school districts. We, we do know that there are some school districts uh, throughout the country that, you know, they, they really don't even want law enforcement in the classrooms and in the buildings uh, for whatever reasons. They, they don't think it's an environment for that. And, and that, I'm not saying that to be controversial, just saying that to say that it's a reality. And, and so I think the focus should be on safety and security is their job and teachers can't teach students can't learn unless they feel safe and secure two simple statements and and so what does that look like then we have to have very hard critical conversations of what does safety and security look like in our schools our children are our most precious resource you know people uh and and we've got to protect people um, so whatever you have that you can throw in there to talk about how safety and security is their primary responsibility, cite the statistics. We have shown shooting situation after situation, law enforcement, even with an SRO on campus, is minutes away, which means the first responder is going to be the adults uh, and children uh, that are immediately impacted by that threat. And what skills or abilities do they have? And I think you can also go back to what we said before, the first recorded school shooting in American history was in 1764. Um, and they continue to happen throughout the country. So we can't bury our head in the sand. Uh, in the wake of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting, this state and our governor took a very proactive response to making sure that we don't let this happen again in Florida and, and we responded to that with this program. Um, what, what, I just wanna to touch upon one thing, uh, Frank, real quick. Uh, you said something very important, which, which we've been saying for, uh, for a while here too, is, is what does safety and security look like? You, you, can't, you can't achieve the outcome. And I, 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 I told the story uh, last week, we had a, a meeting, but um, I did this experiment with my with my daughter in, I was, uh, in the swimming pool, and she and her friend, I asked them to swim to the other side of the pool with without goggles on and with their eyes closed. And they tried three times. They could not make it across the other side of the pool. Fourth time, throw your goggles on with your eyes open, and they made it work right across because they could see the other side of the pool. They had clarity on what the outcome looked like. And so if you're you're telling schools you, you need to be safe and secure, you don't, and you don't have that clarity on what that looks like. You're never going to achieve that goal. And so taking it from a multi-layer approach, giving future educators that clarity of this is what safety and security looks like. Now let's make it happen is absolutely critical. But that that really that resonated, uh, Chief. Uh, Frank. And I was just going to add, I mean, as far as on a district level, there's always a delicate balance. So we don't want to we want to keep it a, a, an educational institution and not turn it into a correctional institution and mm -hmm. can do that. So with everything that we're doing, you can have both. So maybe for the folks that there's no, um, I guess the one from California, you can you know, explain that there's so many things that you could do and we're not trying to turn it into a correctional institution. We're just trying to make a safe learning environment and just keeping that delicate balance at all times. Absolutely. Chief. So, yeah. And to add to what Frank just said, what does safety and security look like? It, it is a mindset. It's being uh, cognizant of your surroundings at all times. That's why we talk about situational awareness. Um, we are all very busy people and we multitask way too much, probably. And we are all also very distracted. Um, with cell phones and other devices. Uh, and I'll give you a good example. Here's what safety and security does not look like. Uh, you leave a store and you go sit in your car and it's time to leave. But before you do that, you check your phone and you go on social media and you're sitting in your car. Oh, and by the way, it's uh, Christmas holiday shopping. And there have been carjackings or stop and robs or thefts of presents and so forth or, you know, Safety and security looks like you getting in your car and waiting to put that phone to your face, you know, later. 
you know, let's get in our car, let's move and let's get out of the area. And so again, it, it all boils down to situational awareness and everyone, no one wants to have to do these things. Like Frank said, we, we you know, we don't want to be hyper vigilant all the time with safety and security, but we have to know when we have to be situationally aware. And, and the example I like to use is it's 245. You are moving your fourth graders from the hard court to back to the classroom. And it's an outdoor type campus situation. What are the, what are the situations, concerns that you should have then versus uh, you're in your classroom, it's 245 and we hear maybe a, a shooting of the other on the campus. Well, what does safety and security look like at that point? So it's always situation. Absolutely. I was just uh, visiting Charles Public County Public Schools last week, and they have the sticker on all the doors. But simple things like closing the door behind you, and, and it's impolite though. It isn't. We're, we, we've always been taught to hold the door open for the person behind you. It's it is a it, it is a paradigm shift, uh, Doctor Z. Right? It's it's thinking from a, from a perspective of safety. But you're absolutely right. We do we do not want to turn our schools into prisons. They they you know that there, there there can be there are ways to do things where it's there's a, the culture and, and other aspects. Um, so Jeff Kelly, hey Jeff. Uh, so Jeff asks if you could please touch on how the 40 hours is comported, uh, what, what's taught in the 40 hours, threat assessment, situational awareness, and name a couple. Who wants to address the 40 hours? I'd do it if I knew, but okay, Hi. Dr. Z. So, um, so, the, so when we say 40 hours, what that um, means is that they're going out into the schools already. So that first um, time that they uh, are introduced to it, there's a 20 hour practicum where they're going out into the schools already. There's a, then they do it again later in the program, there's a 40 hour practicum that they're already going out into the schools. And then with classroom management, there's a 15 hour observation time when they're going out into the schools. So really it's 75 hours that they're out in the schools. And then with that, we've embedded the FERTIS curriculum into those hours. So it's not just dedicated to active shooter training. It's not just dedicated to emergency situations. They're also observing the teacher. They're teaching their practice lessons. They're um, learning about classroom management. Um, and so they're, you know, they're doing small group. They're doing one-on-one. -on -one. They are walking with their students too for transitions. And they, you know, so those are the th times when we want them to be having these conversations like Chief mentioned. So they're with the teacher now, right? They're like their shadow. And so when they're walking them, what is the teacher doing to prepare to go from point A to point B? What does she or he bring with them? Um, do they have a list of the students? Do they have the um, some type of Alyssa alert? You know, how, how, what does their school district use? What does their school use? Um, and so those are the types of questions now that we've embedded into the guided notes that go with the PowerPoint and the videos for that awareness piece. And then with the guided notes, they're asking these questions as they're doing these other requirements. So it's not a 40 hour add-on, it's embedded into what we're already doing. The add-on is really taking our full day PD day in student teaching and dedicating it to safety and security. So. Now this this is, okay, so th this is, I, I think this is fantastic, this program. Um, and, and it's, 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 providing this this foundation and this perspective, uh, this clarity for and, and, comp and imparting confidence for educators. What about administration? Is there are there similar programs for principals and superintendents and you know, you know folks on, on the I, I mean, are, are either of you aware of such a program? Chief or Kim? So so we've we've made two recommendations uh, and one of them in the state of Florida, uh, deals with teachers recertification requirements. And we're exploring the possibility, we've recommended that, um, you know, right now, academically, uh, teachers uh, every five years have to recertify, and they get points for certain classes that they take. And those classes are primarily academic based. So our recommendation is that we start throwing some courses in there that speak more towards pathways to violence, understanding that, um, child sex predation, recognizing signs and symptoms of maybe uh, co-workers 
who have ulterior motives for working with children? And what do you do about that? Because Furtis is, again, not just about active shooter, uh, although we focused a lot of our conversation on that today. It's about emergency situations. It's about safety and security internally and externally. How do we protect our kids and what are we protecting them from? And so I think this, you know, the long answer to your question is uh, looking at addressing recertification requirements. That's not to say, and Frank can probably speak to this, that there aren't programs out there that, you know, uh, educators are taking, administrators are taking right now in Florida. So at the school district, um, the administrators are our critical response team at our schools. So we're training with them pretty much all the time. Um, in my district, when you're looking to become a principal, um, they have, um, I forget the name of what it is, but it's like in training, they take courses and we do speak to them in regards to the same things that we're doing in Ferdinand. So that's my time to actually bring somebody who's now a teacher trying to get into the administrative role and we're going into um, the safety and security at that point. And it's, um, I think it's a six month course. They meet once or twice a week and we usually get a one time slot of that whole course that they get. So they get a little bit of, cause again, now they're transitioning from what they're doing in the classroom to being the lead of the school. So it's important for them to teach. And hey, I wouldn't mind seeing you guys um, doing something at the college for administrators to come. That would be great also. Any help I can get, I will take. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Dr. Z. I was just gonna say, I think it's also different because our population of students are becoming teachers for the first time. And so some of them are employed in the schools, but some of them aren't. And so they haven't been involved in any of these trainings before unless they were a student in high school. So they're like, as we talked about before this gap where administrators have to have three years of teaching to become an administrator. So they have been part of that preparation as Frank talked about at the school district level. But I think their training is different because now they're gonna be leaders. And so they need like a different level of training, but they already maybe have the district's training. So their training I think would look different. Um, as you know, as compared to initial training. And that's kind of what we've been focused on. But then, we, you know, the recommendation has been put forward for recertification for teachers. And it's a whole cycle, right? Because you're, it's I mean, it's, it's, and it's like it's, layers. And, yeah. Exactly. Chief. I just wanted to touch upon briefly our, uh, um, you know, the opportunities that this program has provided, you know, you, you always start things like this with you know, well-meaning, well-intended, and you expect certain outcomes. And, and this has been no different, but the unintended outcomes that come project themselves along the way, uh, first and foremost, uh, it provides a tremendous opportunity to build relationships between law enforcement and a very important group, uh, subgroup in our, in our culture, our teachers. And, and, but not just that, but to acquaint them with a very specific law enforcement officer, and that's the school resource officer, their roles, their duties, their responsibilities, uh, and, and those things. But we also celebrate our school resource officers because, you know, there's a lot of togetherness in our schools as we've seen, and we know the kids love their SROs. And, and so we, we share with them a lot of things about our SROs that they probably wouldn't know otherwise. And we always kick it off on day one, the first question, like, you know, because our, our, our law enforcement and student ratio is fairly high. And, you know, there's cops all lying in the room in various different attire, some tactical, you know, a lot of these guys are really physically fit and they're, they're PT type trainers. And, and you ask the kids, you know, how many of you have ever been in this room with this many cops before, you know, and it's like, well, everybody laughs and, and, uh, but Hey, you know, let's, let's talk about that. What's it look like? And so they get to know law enforcement, uh, you know, for the good things that we do in this profession. Um, and then secondly, it gives us, it gets us an opportunity to learn from our students and their experiences, what they've been through and how we can mold those experiences into the program to, so where other students in the future can benefit from it. No, that, that's awesome. And, and chief, um, I have to ask this because, and I kind of alluded before, but I mean, this this is a this is a, a, a great program, and and so what is the broader vision for this? Is it is it to have it be a Florida based program? Is it to to expand nationwide? If 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 other schools that are participating on this webinar want to implement a, a program at their uh, their college, bringing stakeholders together, what what advice would you give them? 
So I think the answer is, is there's just like we said in Florida, there's no reason that this program cannot exist in every college university in the country that has an education degree program uh, without question. Uh, we provide the framework, the what you determine the how, uh, you know, on your end. And the bottom line is, do we produce educators who are situationally aware, who understand their duties and responsibilities as it pertains to uh, education and safety together? And, and do we save lives? It's all prevention. And, and so the, the broader vision is, yeah, it could certainly go uh, nationwide, but the immediate vision is to act on our uh, commissioner of education's direction to implement this statewide. Uh, it was just a, a huge um, feather in our cap with this program to get that green light from Tallahassee to say, yep, we agree. You need this needs to go statewide. And, and so it's a big challenge, but we're, we're in the process of doing that. And, and I think we can, uh, we can uh, provide a roadmap to other states to follow if it's something that they think they want to do. And if someone is interested, uh, if, if, if someone from a state representative or uh, a, a municipality, a, a, a university, community college is interested in participating, uh, who, who would you recommend that they reach out to or what? Uh, and we will provide this afterwards, folks, as, as part of our um, uh, resources after the event. But um, Chief. Uh -huh. I say call Kim first because <laughs> I was gonna give you your cell phone number, but well, I've already put mine out there. But uh, I'm I'm happy to speak to anyone about the law enforcement piece. But I've said it again. I, I may be adjunct faculty at Denver State College. This program would not exist without any of state college, their support, the leadership and guidance of the, the uh, School of Education. They have been absolutely phenomenal and tremendous. And we put them through these drills in the beginning so they understood what we were trying to accomplish. And they have embraced this. And, and so this, this program, I don't care what state you are, cannot succeed unless you have a, a college that supports it and wants to implement it uh, and, and, you know, make a difference. So. so I would say yes, feel free to reach out. Um, we're starting with the state train the trainers this year, uh, this academic year. Uh, so, you know, if we have slots open, we're more than welcome, you know, welcoming anyone who's interested. Um, or we could set aside a day for um, other, you know, other colleges or institutions around the country. Um, you know, we we uh, started this as just part of our program. It was, you know, um, started with a started with a question, started with a conversation, and now it's growing. So we're we're open to growing with it, just because we see the value in it. Um, and we have, you know, I do have support of my administration in our college. So anything that we can do to support anyone out there, just feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thanks, Kim. Chief. Yeah, one final point. I mean, we've we've termed ourselves as the partners. The partners in this project are the college, law enforcement, and our school districts. You know, we can't do it without those three partners working together. Uh, what are we trying to accomplish in the classroom? What will it look like uh, once they graduate and get in that school? And how can law enforcement help with that? And so anyone who wants to create this program, you have to have good relationships with at least those partners. And then a very important partner for us also is the Department of Education, specifically the Office of Safe Schools. Um, so if any state has that type of organization, they should be looped in as well. And those four partners can really make some magic happen. And, and that's the whole thing. And uh, I'm sure of my Zero Now t-shirt, but uh, you know, the, the, our mantra is together we'll make school safer for good. And that's the key thing is it, it, it can't just be one organization, one individual. It is a collaborative effort. It's what we call collective impact, right? Collective impact. We all have the same outcome. How are we going to work that way together? And um, I know Tallahassee, uh, you know, charged you to, to spread this out throughout Florida, but I think this should be a na national a national program. I think every school, because this is, in Todd Langley, absolutely, this is part of a a holistic holistic approach you know it's not just one thing this is part of a you know part of a, an approach that involves everybody including teachers um we and and i knew this was going to happen so we, we we run out of time but we still have more questions that we did not answer and a, and a bunch of questions that came in from registrants so um if you go to the zero now community just go to zero now.org click on community you'll see a, a post on there with the graphic for today's webinar along with uh, some of the questions that you can continue to ask uh, Chief Frank and Dr. Z um, after this webinar. Uh, if there are other questions that you have not uh, been answered that you have yet to ask, you go ahead and do that there. Um, please do so. Um, and I just want to 
give heads up. So our next our next uh, round table is, is about swatting. I and mean, this has been a topic that's been coming up all too frequently, unfortunately, but it's it's about the dangerous and deadly consequences of online pranks. And that is going to be July 18th. And uh, just real quick, any final thoughts, comments? Uh, Chief, we'll start with you. Let's go around real quick. Thank you so much for putting this on. We'd love to get the word out. We're very proud of our program, and we and we know it can succeed. Thank you again. We want to work with you to get this uh, get this out there, helping in any way we can. Uh, we always use the term you know, helping prevention go viral, and this is this is certainly one way to do it. Dr. Z, final thoughts, words of wisdom for our participants. Sure. And I would also be interested if there is any other programs like this out in the country, you know, if anyone is starting something, please reach out to us, you know, we can learn from you and we'd love to add, add to it. Um, and so, you know, I'd love to continue that conversation. So thank you for giving us this opportunity. Excellent. Thank you. Frank, Chief. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the, the time spent here. And um, there was one quick question on there that I could answer. Yes, we include parents also. So like you said, together, we do it. We always include our community parents. So once they get to us, we, uh, we do include the parents with uh, everything that we're doing. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Frank, Chief, and Dr. Z. Really appreciate your sharing your experience and, and this program, which is, which is incredible. Uh, please go to the Zero Now community. We'll continue the conversation, and we'll all see you soon. Please stay safe. Take care.